Okay, we're in the book of Numbers tonight. Book of Numbers, and we're going to read quite a bit tonight. We'll read it in two parts, so we're going to read uh, chapter 13 first and have a look at some of the thoughts there, and then we'll read some of chapter 14 a little later. Numbers, of course, is the fourth book in your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Genesis covers a period around about two and a half thousand years uh, by Martin Anstey's chronology 2,513 years or so. Exodus covers a period <coughs> of 144 years, 11 and a half months according to Martin Anstey. Leviticus of course which is the offerings after they have come out of uh, Egypt and the tabernacle has been set up. Leviticus covers a period of just one month. And then the book of Numbers, which of course takes place also after the coming out of Egypt, covers a period of around, I think, 144 years. Uh, sorry, 38 years and nine months is the book of Numbers. And we're going to read from chapter 13, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send their men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send them out, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And these were their names of the tribe of Reuben, Shamua the son of Zachar, of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Horoi, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of the tribe of Issachar, Igel, the son of Joseph, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu, Raphu, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodai, of the tribe of Joseph, namely of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadai, the son of Susai. Of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali. Gamali. Of the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. Of the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vafsi. Of the tribe of Gad, Guel, the son of Makai. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshia the son of Nun, Jehoshua. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. Be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south, and came unto Hebron, or Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. They came unto the brook of Eshcol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bared it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron, and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and to the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover we saw the children of Anak there, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of Jordan. 
Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Just going to draw out a few things that struck me reading through here. And then if we have time, we'll get into chapter, in, chapter uh, 14 as well. Uh, verse 17 and Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. Spying is an old business, evidently. Uh, one can well understand, of course, that one nation would spy upon another. But what I've noticed about spies in the Old Testament, certainly those that God sends out, like, like Joshua sent, you remember, the spies into uh, Jericho and these are sent here up from Kadesh Barnea uh, they go secretly but you never find them lying of course if you watch any of the spy films they're always liars aren't they but you don't find that least correct me if I'm wrong I haven't noticed that in the scriptures those two men that went into Rahab's house you remember in Jericho they didn't tell any lies they were hidden there she lied but they didn't lie and she told them how to escape and so on and so forth so they'd gone in to look at the land but there's no indication that they told any lies um, neither was there any indication that the men that went to uh, Rahab's house in Jericho that they lied so I suppose if I were in a position of political leadership I might think it wise and maybe you would too to send spies into other countries but not to be dishonest there's no reason why you shouldn't go and watch what's going on, it seems to me, and report back. Uh, but that's spying in the Bible very different to what goes on, it seems to me, these days. Verse 18. And see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. Now God had promised uh, that they would be led into the promised land. God had brought them out of Egypt. He told Moses, and Moses had no doubt told the people that they were going to go in and inherit the land of Canaan. So the promise is there, but nevertheless. They were to go in and use intelligence. They were to go in, as the old preachers used to say, and use means. It wasn't just that they would go in blindly because God had sent them in there. They are sent out here to spy out the land in the first place. And sometimes, you know, we have a responsibility. In fact, perhaps always we have a responsibility. Even if we know that God has, has sent us to do something or called us to do something, to use our intelligence about how that should be done properly which is what's going on here and then in verse 22 we read of the children of Anak and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron where Ahiman, Shishai and Telmai the children of Anak were uh, now if you look down at verse 33 the last verse of chapter 13 and there we saw the giants the sons of Anak so these men mentioned Ahiman, Shishai and Telmai were giants and uh, we, we don't know that they were the only ones it would suggest as I read through it it would suggest the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites in verse 29 that they were probably giants among them as well um, and we'll think a little bit more about the giants when we get down to verse uh, to the end of the chapter verse 25 and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. You perhaps are aware that 40 is a number of testing in the Bible. And you often find it connected with the word the, the, the clever people use is probation. But it's the same thing as testing. You often find it connected with a, with a period of testing. 
Moses was in the mountain for 40 days. What was going on down in the down at the bottom of the mountain? In a sense, the people being tested and they turned to idolatry while Moses was in the mountain for 40 years. The Lord Jesus, from the beginning of his ministry, through his crucifixion and on until the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, 40 years, the Lord begins his ministry, we believe, around about AD 30. We know that uh, uh, Jerusalem fell to Titus in AD 40. 40 years. The Jews had a 40-year period in which from the beginning of the Lord's ministry they might have turned to God. But having hardened themselves, of course, in unbelief, destruction came in spades, so to speak, in AD 70 when Titus destroyed Jerusalem. Verse 27. After they've come back, we read, They told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Milk and honey. It's a land of milk and honey. It's described as a land of milk and honey. Now, milk, we learn from the New Testament, speaks of the word of God for babes. Uh, the milk of the word we read of Paul Peter says desire the sincere milk of the word Paul I believe writes to the Hebrews says I no longer fed you with milk but we, or rather you are not able to eat meat but milk so when we read of milk we're reading of uh, in spiritual terms we're reading of that which is for babies for young Christians for new Christians for Christians are not taught well but it's also a land of honey and honey is food for valiant men, you find, as you look at the occurrences of it in the Bible. You remember when uh, Samson went down to visit Delilah, a lion attacked him and he tore that lion limb from limb. And the next time he went down, there was honey in the lion. You see, uh, Samson had overcome the lion. He was a, he was a valiant man. And after defeating that lion, he finds the honey. You remember when Saul is fighting with the Philistines and he tells his, his own army that they're not to eat anything. And Jonathan hasn't heard this. And so Jonathan, uh, having defeated a Philistine garrison, finds some honey dripping from a honeycomb and he puts his staff in the honey, you remember, and he takes the honey after he has destroyed the Philistine garrison. It's food for valiant men, or shall we just say for men? And of course, the great, the greatest illustration of all, which you'll only find in the King James Bible, is in Luke 24, where after the Lord's resurrection, they give him a piece of broiled fish and a an honeycomb. After his victory, he eats the honeycomb in the King James Bible, but not in most of the others. It's food for men, a land of milk and honey. Is that where God meets the needs of babes and meets the, meets, meets the needs of the mature? And so you find in the word of God, as, as Spurgeon once said, it's a children's storybook and it's a greybeard's manual. You'll never, ever, ever exhaust this book. The riches are beyond telling in this book if you want them, if I want them. There's food here for babes. There are, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All these wonderful stories for young children. But there's meat for men if you want it. Of course, most Christians don't want it. They've still got milk teeth, and they still want milk. And uh, and oftentimes they don't want much of that either. Milk and honey for babes and for men. And uh, what they what they also said here in verse 27. Uh, was this is the fruit did they not let me see and this is the fruit of it we were thinking about fruit was it wednesday we talked about the fruit of the spirit uh, i can't remember but recently i was talking about the fruit of the spirit and uh, what this fruit represents is the abundance in the land they they had a bunch of grapes and it took it took two of them at least to carry this bunch of grapes on a pole on their shoulders that's the fruit of the land and, and when we get into, when we're men and we get into fighting country for the Lord, there's wonderful fruit. And it's that wonderful fruit, not just the milk, which we need even as grown-ups, and not just honey, but there's abundant fruit. And we saw, we looked at that fruit sometime recently, I don't know when, I'm getting old, I can't remember. In Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, and so on. And we were saying, I was saying, wasn't I, how that this is what the Lord is looking for. That fruit of Galatians 5.22 is what the Lord is looking for. 
Above all else, that's what he's looking for. Not whether we have an extension on the church, not whether the numbers grow, not whether I get a higher salary, not whether my business prospers, but is the love of God in me? Is the joy of the Lord in me? Do I know peace with God? And so on. That's the fruit that God is looking for. And here in the promised land, that is the place where we ought to be with God, there is abundant fruit as much indeed as any man could want verse 30 Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it I always remember the church where Jean and I met the pastor preaching one Sunday and he said two came back with the grapes and ten came back with the grapes and uh, so it is still to this very day there were two men of faith and ten men of fear and uh, sadly you and I sometimes we're not as faithful as, as we ought to be we're too fearful at times we're not prepared to go into battle sometimes and uh, it, it isn't pleasing nor is it honoring to God when we back off uh, from what he's told us to do but Caleb and Joshua were different altogether and what you find as we we might, we might get into in chapter 14 is that those moaners all died in the wilderness but Caleb and Joshua went on into the promised land indeed Joshua led them in he's called Oshia in verse 16 here and, and, and Moses calls him Jehoshua but it's the Joshua of course who took them into the promised land a man of faith verse 32 and they brought up an evil report, that is the other ten. They brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel. The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. We need to be very careful about publicizing our fear and unbelief. This had a real detrimental effect upon the whole congregation it brought great harm these men coming back in unbelief and speaking out their unbelief and their fear caused great harm uh, in the congregation I've heard here once or twice I'm not going to name any names and I've not got anybody in mind who's here tonight but I've heard some extraordinary statements of unbelief sometimes in the back room come out of people's mouths as though God's going to close us down tomorrow nonsense nonsense there's no reason to think so at least I'm not aware of any reason to think so God hasn't been doing that for the last several years last Sunday morning was a blessing we had a number of visitors but even if we hadn't had visitors it would still be a blessing Amen. but we are all you know so often I hear people just uttering their fear and unbelief we need to be careful that we're not guilty of that because it can make it life the Christian life difficult for others it can pass that fear on to others the Lord Jesus said, didn't he? Men shall give an account of every idle word that they speak. And what was their fear here, the men of great stature? Look at verse 33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. They, these men must have been huge huge we know that some of them were around 12 feet tall uh, we know that Goliath if you take the cubits as 1 foot 9 Goliath was either 11 foot 6 or 12 foot 3 we know that Og's bed the king of Bashan was 13 foot 6 there are rumours of skeletons I don't know whether they're true but there are rumours of skeletons being found 36 feet tall they said we were a grasshopper. Now, how big is a grasshopper compared to you? In their sight, these men were colossal. And that's what they were afraid of. Now, I'm going to say, I have no doubts in my own mind, that these are the kind of men that appeared in Genesis chapter 6. Calvin, who was as blind as a bat coming in backwards, says this was the sons of Shem, and all the Calvinists have followed him ever since. Nonsense. They were giants. The Bible says they were giants. They were what are called the demigods. They were the, uh, the giant men of Greek mythology. They were not the sons of Shem at all in Genesis 6. And so we find them here. Huge, huge men. And they're still around in Canaan when, of course, the, um, the Israelites get in there. 
So let's read on then now a little in chapter 14. We're not, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but let's read a little more. Chapter 14. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. That's what moaning will do for you. Verse 2. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defence is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. And Moses said unto the Lord, that Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. They will tell it to the inhabitants of the land, for they have heard that the Lord art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, iniquity of this people, according to the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and not a hearken to my voice, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land, whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. So verse 1 then of chapter 14, let's just look at that again. And the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Here is the de devastating demoralization arising, arising from 10 unbelieving men. I find it very interesting that how in wartime uh, the, the, a good leader giving a good speech can do so much for the army, can do so much for the morale. Uh, I've got uh, Churchill's speeches on CD and those are powerful speeches. Those were powerful speeches that he made. Now, Churchill was a man who was very well up on his history. He knew all about uh, many, many and many a battle. And Churchill's speeches no doubt had a great deal to do with the morale of our army and the morale of the people here in this country. We will fight them on the beaches. You know, you've heard these. We'll fight them on the beaches. We'll fight them on the landing grounds. We'll fight them in the air. We will never surrender. And uh, leaders, military leaders throughout the years have given good, stirring speeches very often before uh, the men went into battle. I don't know how, how accurate, I mean, uh, the, the great St. Crispian's Day speech, Henry V, before they go into, um, what's the name of the place? 
it's after Harfleur, it gives a speech before Harfleur, the famous one, uh, I can't remember it, but there's a big famous battle where Henry V fought the French and the French were sorely defeated, I mean something like, I don't know, thousands to one. And before that, in the Shakespeare presentation, Henry V gives this tremendous, it's referred to as a St. Crispian's Day speech. Now, it was commonplace, I think, for military leaders to do that. I think Titus, in fact, Titus not only uh, would have, I dare say, spoken to his army, but he, but he, he pleaded with the Jews to give up uh, before, um, and they wouldn't, of course, before Jerusalem was destroyed. And so we, we see here, they lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. And we read only those few verses about their absolute unbelief. Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Would God we had died in this wilderness. And as I was saying recently, you know, uh, people in the churches, some of them have got such long faces, they're so miserable. And uh, that, 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 if only they could go back to the world. And some of them, of course, do. And uh, they're always looking back at Egypt, they're always looking back at the old life, they're always looking at the world, they're always looking over the fence, as it were, to see what the world has to offer. And it's an insult to God, and they're greatly insulting the Lord here, which why the Lord, of course, is so angry with them. Verse 4. And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. God will... I dare say always put hardships in our way as unbelievers to try us and to teach us to call upon him and find our strength in him. We ought not to expect. God is looking to make, if you'll excuse me ladies, he's looking to make men of us. In other words, he's looking to make soldiers of us all. He doesn't want milksops in his church. He wants people of faith who are prepared to take the world on for the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus. And so he will often bring us into trials. You don't have to be saved very long before you discover this. And sometimes those trials are hard. And if we're sensible, we turn to our Bibles. If we're sensible, we turn to prayer. And sometimes even believers in the church will encourage us like these did to unbelief. And we have to go to the Lord and we have to go to prayer and we have to exercise some faith. But we will find if we will do that, that the Lord will take us through those difficulties. And then we will have a victory to look back on. And then when the next difficulty comes, the Lord will take us through that and we'll have two victories to look back on. And we'll be able to say with Joshua, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. There's no escaping, I think hardships if we mean business with God and the more we mean business with God the more sore I think the trials generally will be Christians sometimes find that the way is harder than they expected perhaps so they decide to go back to the old life it was much easier when I spent Sunday at the football match than it is since I've been professing the Lord and, and so on and we've seen that happen. Verse 7. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, this is Joshua and Caleb, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. The Bible says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. John was speaking to us last Sunday about the good hand of God upon us. And yes, there are giants there. We might, I'm not sure whether we're going to get into these, but we might do. There are giants there, but in that place, it's a good land. It's a place of plenty. It's a place where God becomes more real. And the Christian life becomes more wonderful. Verse 9. Joshua and Caleb continue. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defence is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. As Paul writes to us in the Roman letter, If God be for us, who can be against us? I've had some threats of late. Some brother threatening me, the Lord's going to kill me, and so on. And I might want to surround myself with muscular men. But I have the Lord. And if God be for us, 
who can be against us. And we need to remember this, and it's only in those times of trial when we learn to lean upon the Lord that we, we, we find how strong he is. David would often speak. I mean, the Psalms are such a blessing in this regard because David was often in battle. He was often in trial. As a king and as a godly king, he was going to be in constant battle. And yet he would talk of the Lord as his tower and his strength and his refuge and so forth. And so it is. These enemies were formidable to say the least. And the enemies arrayed against the church tonight are more formidable perhaps than most of us realise. Great evil spirits that control nations we read about in book of Daniel, round right about chapter 10, chapter 11. Satan has his spirits that control whole nations and under those spirits that control the leaders of those nations. And so much of what we see in the political area and in the religious area and in education and so on, these are satanic strategies above all else to destroy the church and to destroy any witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our enemies are varied and they are very powerful but the Lord is greater than all of them. Satan's power is probably far greater than any of us realise but the Lord still is infinitely greater and and is no threat. The only time Satan and his devils become a threat for us is when we deliberately sin. And the Lord will often, even then, the Lord will often mercifully shield us, I'm sure. But we put ourselves in danger of Satan's attacks if we deliberately disobey the Lord. We might just get a whooping from some evil spirit. Excuse my Americanisms. I watch too much American stuff and I listen to too many American preachers. I'm sorry about that. So our enemies are strong. We we get. I was saying to John on Sunday, you know, uh, sometimes I'm sad. Jean thinks I'm sad a lot, and uh, I don't know whether it is a lot. I don't know. But I was saying to John, when you look out at our society. When I think about what my, the threats my grandchildren are under, when I think about the threats that Christian children are under, when I think about what's going on in the schools, when I think about the perversion of the nation, when I think about the sodomites mar- marching through our cities, being paid for by my taxes and yours, it's enough to make you sad. And it does make me sad. And I said to John, he that's not melancholy, he's a fool that's not melancholy once a day. We ought to be, the normal normal life for a Christian ought to be cheerfulness. Whether I measure up to that, you'll have to ask Gene, I don't know, possibly not, I don't know. But, you know, there's much to make us sad. Our enemies are formidable. But there ought never to be enough to make us give up. Because the Lord is with us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 10 of chapter 14. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. This is, this is Caleb and Joshua now. These are the two of the ten that came back with the grapes instead of the gripes. And now because they've spoken up faithfully, the rest of the people want to stone them. Faithful, God-honouring, God-fearing, preaching or witness, like Joshua and Caleb, will draw malicious opposition even sometimes from within the churches. Or from, prof- or from the professing church sometimes I try not to fret about few numbers or my own lack of popularity it is to be, it is to be expected Caleb was unpopular they wanted to stone them uh, Joshua was unpopular It is to be expected if I am faithful that there are going to be a lot of people in the churches that don't like me and the same goes for you. We we ought not to be expected to be popular. We ought not to seek to be popular. We ought to be seek to be faithful. Come what may, we will be faithful. The Lord Jesus said, and many a Christian needs to hear it, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Woe unto you. When all men speak well of you. Well I thank the Lord I can say they don't all speak well of me. Maybe I deserve to be all spoken of. That's another story. 
but sometimes I'm sure I'm ill spoken of because I've preached the truth again the saviour says that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination to God <laughs> and couldn't we spend some time on that one that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination to God verse 13 and Moses said unto the Lord then the Egyptians shall hear it for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them the Lord has heard everything of course that has been said the Lord hears everything that you say hears everything that I say the Lord hears it all it's, it's an astonishing thought when you think there are 7 billion people in the world and the Lord knows right now what everybody's thinking let alone what they've said that's an amazing thought but he does and you find this Jake, uh, David said didn't he in Psalm 139 before a word is in my tongue O Lord thou knowest it all together thou knowest my down sitting thou knowest my uprising and uh, so the Lord had heard all this and yet Moses intercedes and Moses had been on the sharp end of it as well Mo Moses was criticised Moses was clearly a remarkable humble and patient man I doubt there are many pastors, if any, or elders who were so pa who today are so patient, who have ever been so patient as Moses was. Verse fifteen and sixteen. Verses fifteen and sixteen. We're not long to go. Now, if thou shalt kill all these people, Moses said to the Lord, as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sweared on and therefore he has slain them in the wilderness Moses reminds the Lord that it is, it is his honour and his name that is at stake and I take great comfort from that I believe the Lord will look after me because his name and his honour is at stake for 40 years I've been telling people I'm a Christian for 40 years I've been telling people Jesus Christ is Lord I believe that God will look over me for his own name's sake and for the, name, for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because for years I've been telling people he is the Lord and therefore I believe as David says in Psalm 23 in fact let me just get the words right um, because it really is a, a comfort and a consolation to me Psalm 23 David says he restoreth my soul he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake and I thank the Lord for that and the, Moses reminds the Lord you will be blasphemed if you destroy these people verse 19 pardon I beseech thee the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now here's one man okay you can add if you will you can add Aaron on you can add Joshua and Caleb but this one praying man for sure brought great good to the whole congregation of Israel and the Lord Jesus of course has brought great good to us all we live and breathe tonight because of that one man who came down from the glory and went to Calvary's cross. That's the only reason we're spared. The only reason we're spared is because the Lord Jesus came and died for us. We don't deserve it. We're as bad as these people. We're as bad as these people. They would just point at Israel and say what a bunch of stinkers they were. We're as bad as they are. We're the seed of Adam too by nature. But one man stood in the gap for us, made up the hedge as it says in Ezekiel and brought us great good and will take us to glory in spite of what we are just like Moses said here pardon I beseech thee the Lord Jesus didn't just say it he gave his life and he gave his blood that we might be saved verses 22 and 23 we're nearly done 22 and 23 because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me these now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers neither shall any of them that provoked me see it they are going to reap what they have sown and sadly even for Christians this is true we are warned about this in Galatians chapter 5 God did not immediately destroy them because Moses has interceded for them 
but none of them made it out of the wilderness. They spent their lives in the wilderness. And whining Christians, and I'm like them sometimes, if they're not careful, well, they will. They'll spend their lives in the wilderness. Bread and circuses, that's all so many of them want. And they'll spend their lives in the wilderness. They'll never make it, this side of glory, into the promised land. They'll never come to know what it is to enjoy the milk and honey and the grapes of Eshcol. Whatever, what it is to know the good land which the Lord has provided because they're always moaning I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do the other the church can't do this, the church can't do that the church can't do the other as I say, if we will not trust the Lord we too, as so many are today will spend our lives in a spiritual wilderness I used to, uh, I've said this to you before I used to be bothered by that hymn trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey because I always thought well I'm saved by grace so how can it be that I've got to trust and obey to be happy in Jesus but that's the point it's to be happy in Jesus it's when we're obedient that we're going to discover we're going to, we're going to have the milk and honey so to speak we're going to find the grapes and we're going to have the spiritual joy that God saves us to have but if we don't trust and if we don't obey, we will be saved if we've trusted him for our salvation, but we'll just be miserable. And the churches I mentioned, I think, Wednesday, didn't I? I used to preach in 12 churches. I only preach in two now. Ten of them went south because they were miserable. They were so miserable, it would be unbelief I'd go in on a Sunday night. You could tell they didn't want to be there. No sooner you'd said, Amen, the back door was flapping like a bee's wing. They were out. And now they're gone. I'm perhaps being a bit too flippant about it. It's really sad. God has removed those candlesticks. We talked, didn't we, on was it Wednesday about cutting down the tree? Dig it about and dung it, and if you bear fruit this year, well, if not, cut it down. And churches are being cut down because they're miserable, and they're miserable because they're in the wilderness, and they're in the wilderness because they won't believe God and they won't trust Him. And I've said to you also before, and I will close with this, I could be in... Canaan today and in the wilderness tomorrow I can be in the wilderness in the morning and Canaan in the afternoon and we need a constancy about our faith, God helping us so that we're in Canaan all the time and we're not frightened of and we're not made to run and we're not made to deny the Lord when, when serious enemies come against us because they will they will of one sort or another I mean there are massive forces against the church as a whole but we will have our individual battles as well but I thank God that I've got a book here in which, in which God speaks. I thank the Lord that I can open my Bible when I'm down, cast them. There's promises here for me. And as old Herbert Rouse used to say, I'm ready to go bear hunting with a switch. I don't know what it was, sometime this week. Uh, I didn't feel so good. I went to my room half an hour later, man, I was coming out swinging. It's just the promises of God are just such a blessing. And we have a great God and we have a great Saviour. And even we few... We happy few, we band of brothers. Sorry about the Shakespeare. We can do great things for the Lord if only we'll trust him. Amen. Great. We're going to sing then 427.